Thank you very much. Take your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And uh, we're going to continue on basically what we started last week. Uh, Solomon has been giving us wise advice about how to live life under the sun, how to live life in our sinful, broken world, how to live life when it's hard and it's difficult. And, and life itself has all these different, different things that come at us. It's just life. It, it, life is what life is. But Solomon, near the end of his life, has compiled this experience this experiment called Ecclesiastes. The name of the book means the preacher. And so what he's wanting us to understand is that I've written this to stand before you to tell you these things, probably so that you don't do what he has done. So that he would warn us and keep us away from the pits and the holes that he fell into, the sin that he gave his life over to. And so last week, he began to really apply it practically with Proverbs. And we're going to continue that on today. So in chapter 11, all the way down to chapter 12, verse 8, is where we're going to be this morning. So let's read together. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or eight, for you do not know what disaster may happen on the earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He, he who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body. For youth in the dawn of life our vanity. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few. And those who look through the windows are dimmed, and the doors on the street are shut, when the sound of the grinding is low, and one rises up at the, at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along. Are you confused yet? I love how Solomon talks. Very proverbial, very um, picturesque. The grasshopper drags itself along and desires and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth, earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And when we read that, maybe you're not like me, but maybe you are. And when we read that, at first I'm like, what in the world is he saying? There's so many picture things. There's so many kind of um, 
representative things and symbolic things, and it really is kind of confusing at times. But can I tell you, when you read vanity of vanities, it's all empty, it's all graspless, it just all slips through your hands several times as you do in this text, you, you really begin to think, wow, is this kind of, is he just in that old man cynical stage and negative and, and wow, what, what is this all about? Well, actually, I tell you, it is some profound wisdom about how to live life. Specifically for you and I, how to live life in this broken world as a follower of God. See, life under the sun, probably a statement that some of you might be getting tired of because it's been so repetitive. So life under the sun, life under the sun. But what do we do day in and day out? We live life under the sun. We started speaking of this topic and preaching through the book of Ecclesiastes back in October of last year. Today is the 15th message out of this book. We have one to go. And it's not actually one for next week. It's not really one that Solomon himself penned, but it was an explanation of all that Solomon said and what his point really was. From this word, out of nearly 15 messages now in the book, we understand that all this world provides, it's hevel. It just, there's nothing in this world itself that we can hold to that will satisfy the deepest aspects of the soul of man. No material possession or power or wealth or prestige or even wisdom. And Solomon spent a lot of his time, you know, looking into wisdom. He said none of that is going to satisfy life. None of that is the sole purpose and meaning to living. It's just going to slip through. You'll never hold it. And, and because, because we can't hold it, we become exasperated and maybe even cynical like he seems to be at times. Life in itself does not satisfy. There has to be a higher and greater purpose. He tells us that. He tells us what that is. You know, you think that you don't really find out the meaning of life until the end of the book, but scattered through all this uh, story, this history, this book, this preacher's sermon what we find is is that God is the only answer and to live for him is our only hope we are told that we are actually created with a God given purpose there, he says that eternity is in our heart though even though eternity is in our heart, even though we, we have and can have this eternal perspective, we don't understand the one who holds eternity fully. We don't know how God works in everything. We don't even know God's mind in everything. God's ways are often not our ways. They are beyond our ways. And, and we live in this veil that we won't see until we cross over and see him face to face. And we have this veil. But what Solomon wants to do is open up that veil to show us that life is really meant to live. And even though we don't understand God in all his ways, we can trust God and we need to trust God. So last week, the writer brought right down to where the rubber meets the road, as I said last week, a practical application of how to live life. He began with a slew of Proverbs, giving us advice that would help us understand our world, help us to have principles to live by under the sun in this broken world. He told us how the wise are to live, and he told us that oftentimes, the wisdom and the wise that, that, that we, the wisdom that we are told or the wisdom that we are given and the, the wise people are often rejected by everybody around them. I, I don't understand sometimes when 
we talk to people about Christ and they just reject him. I understand, but I don't understand. Does that make sense? That's what Solomon tells us. And then he hit, really hits us with a heavy hammer and he tells us and says this, listen, you can have all the wisdom in the world and you can live your life in a very wise way, but just one sinful act, one act of temper or giving in to temptation, it can, it can ruin an entire life of living by those principles. And it's not to make us, like, then what's the point? It's to make us realize, watch our life. Be careful of what you do. Put even guardrails around your life to protect you from going beyond the place that you ought not to go beyond. It's crazy to think just one act of foolishness could do that. But that's what he told us. And so he told us in Proverbs how to guard our life, how to watch our life, and how to live our life. And today he finishes that. So what I'd really like to talk to you, the title of this message is Solomon's Final Instructions. And some of you are thinking, wait, wait a minute, we still have verses 9 through 14 at the end of chapter 12. And that's the best part. Yes. But these are Solomon's final practical applications of how you want to live your life. Listen, does anybody go to a job and not want to know how to do the job? You know, Gary, so Gary he, he's working in a factory now. And I th my language, you're making pasta, right, Gary? He's making pasta. Have you ever made pasta before in your life? No. You worked in a bank before, didn't you? He had no idea about pasta making. But I tell you what, if you and I, you know, go to the shop that sells his pasta, we want him to know how to make pasta, right? You don't want to eat a pasta that doesn't cook right. You don't want to eat a pasta that doesn't have the right ingredients. You don't want to eat a pasta that doesn't hold the mussels and the clams and the, and the prawn properly, right, Lance? You need a good pasta, so they train him. And you know what Solomon and, and, and the Lord is doing through this book? He's giving us the things to train us how to live life under the sun. So, because we want to get to the Lord's Supper and I want to begin to direct our minds to the, to the real centerpiece of what this is all about, may I just give you quickly some thoughts in this final instruction of Solomon to our life, this final bit of continued wisdom to live under the sun. And here's what he says at the very first thought of, of chapter 11. You do know that when they wrote these originally, there were no chapter divisions, there were no verse divisions. He was just spewing words, right? It was all together. It's we later on added these. So the division isn't inspired. It's just helpful. So really, this was all a part of what he started to say last week. And here's what he says today. He says, beloved, don't waste your life. Listen, do not waste your life. Verses 1 and 2 in, Ecclesi in chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the water, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven or to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. You think, what, what does that have to do about don't waste your life? He's really talking about living by faith. Living your life abundantly. Our text says, cast your bread upon the waters. Do you know what that is, is alluding to? It's alluding to a ship. And it's the, this owner has the ship, and he's going to uh, load it with all kinds of seeds and things, and he's going to send it across the seas so that it will prosper, so that it will bring forth something. And what Solomon is saying is don't live your life, even though it's under the sun, don't live your life in a way where you never take the chance 
to cast your bread upon the waters. Where you, where you give total commitment. Do you know, the call to Jesus is deny, take up, and follow me. It's all in. The, to be a Christian isn't to sit on the sidelines and say, well, I'll just watch it go by. No, to be a follower of Christ is to jump in and get on with it and be a part of it. And that's what Solomon is saying. Roy, he's saying, listen, life is hard, right, but live it anyway. Don't, don't waste what God has given to you. Take the blessings, take the giftedness, take your finances, take your abilities and use them, cast them out, and let's see what God will prosper them by and what results might come of it. It is a total commitment. It is a stepping out in faith. It's that idea of you load your boat with all that you have, and you send it out, and you trust God to bring back the profit or the result or the benefit. Do you know most of us, we wake up, or not most, say, some. We have this tendency, because things are difficult, we get beaten down a little bit. And all we really want to do is get to the next morning in order to get to bedtime to get to the next morning. And that is no way to live life. He says, cast it out. Cast your, cast your bread upon the waters. Live by faith. Give of yourself. Verse 2, a lot of folks think that verse 2 is a great verse about how to invest in stocks in the market. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. It says, what's it say? I'll tell you in a minute. Give a portion to seven or to eight. It means cast out to seven things, cast out to eight things. Just give a portion a little here and a little there. See what will happen. You know what he's saying there is this. Give of your life. Cast it out. I, I was reading a commentary. And what one commentary, um, Wearsby, you probably know it, Joe. He said this. Guys, life is an adventure. Live it. God's called you for a purpose. God's called you for meaning. Solomon, at the end of his life, realizes this now, and he says, this is what he's teaching. Don't waste it. Load the ship. Get in the ship. Give of yourself. Live generously. Live of, of that attitude that, you know what? Maybe it is hard under the sun, but I'm not going to allow it to stop me to live this life. Be involved. Don't be a holder. That's part of what verse 2 is saying. Don't take just and hoard what you've been given in life. Use it. The, you ever heard the term use it or lose it? That's about a skill usually. If you don't use your skill, you'll lose your skill. Like I took high school Spanish. I can order a taco, and that's about it. I, I can say, que pasa, uh, donde esta, something like that. That's the ultimate use of my two years of high school Spanish. Do you know why? Because I lost it. Because I didn't use it. And that Solomon is saying, listen, don't waste your life. And you know what? As you're not wasting your life, as you get in and you cast your bread upon the water and you live generously, you have to create a character within you that you will not be stopped easily. You really got to understand, I think Solomon is talking from experience here. Do you not think he would wish that he could go back when he was young and cling back to the things of his youth, when he spoke to God, when he committed himself to God? Don't you think he regrets much of what he did, worshiping false gods, chasing all those things, you know, 
basically turning away from the Lord for a good portion of his middle to older years until near the end? Do you not think he regrets that? In what he's saying in verses 3 through 5, when it says, If the clouds are full of rain and they empty themselves on the earth, and if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. You know what he's saying? He's saying, don't allow the circumstances to stop you from living this life for God. Let's face it. Satan and his evil forces, do you know what I think they do a lot of times? They try to use life to derail us in living with purpose for Jesus by life under the sun. It tries to wear you out. Let me give you a quote. Living the life of faith, one that is not to be wasted, one that is to be generous, living this life as an adventure, it's exciting, but it also can be frightening because of the unknown, because of life under the sun. But we are to live life, that life of faith, as an adventure, taking the opportunities God presents to us. Those verses about rain, the trees falling, and the wind, do you know what it means? Here's what we do as people. I know I do this sometimes. I'll wait for the perfect opportunity. When I was learning how to drive years ago, I've had to learn twice. I had to learn how to drive as an American, and then when I came to this country, I had to learn to drive as not an American. And I had to learn a completely different style. We, we are on the other side of the road and all that kind of stuff. I remember with my dad. We was in his pickup truck and I was learning. I was learning how to do the gears and I was doing great. And I, I, was, I was at the, um, an intersection and lots of traffic. And I was waiting and I was waiting and I was thinking, I got to wait for a big opening and a big opening and I wait for the perfect spot. And my mom said, you know, you need to make a decision. It, it, the perfect time is never going to come. Look for the right one and go. What did I do? I just went. <laughs> Pulled right out in front of a car. Praise God, didn't get hit. They came to a screeching halt. And my mom got so scared, she whacked me upside the head and said, what are you doing? You know what I was doing? I was waiting for the perfect time, but it never showed up. And I'm not telling us to pull out into traffic but what Solomon is saying is you can't be afraid to make the decisions you can't be afraid to to do life and live life and too often we wait for that perfect timing but it doesn't come so we just stop and we don't do anything how many people in this church have wanted to get involved in maybe Sunday school or, or offerings or ushering or you wanted to get involved in, in, in praying or worship team. You wanted to do something in ministry. But, you know, I've got this and I've got that and I've got this and I've got that. Well, guess what? The time will never come unless you just say, I'm going to follow the Lord and I'm going to do it. And you step out. Solomon probably had a lot of regrets in his life. And this is where it's coming from. He's saying, don't allow the excuses to keep you from living. Make the best of today and trust God. Do you know why? Because you don't know what God is doing. And verse 5 says, you don't know the work of God who makes everything. I have this philosophy in my life. I, I believe this is what God does. He's doing something. I just don't always know what it is. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek him through his word. I'm probably going to ask good godly counsel from other godly people around me. And I'm going to put all that together and I, because I want to do for God. Amen? I want to do for God. So I'm not going to just wait for the perfect timing. I'm not going to wait for the miracle to show up. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek. I'm going to think, I'm going to counsel, and then I'm going to allow the Lord to lead me through all those things and do. 
And, and, and that's why some of us just sit and never go anywhere for Christ. I know this next language is going to be a little hard and, and maybe you won't like the word. But not only does Solomon say, don't waste your life. Don't be easily stopped. He also says, don't be lazy about it. Verse 6, look at it. Solomon says, cast your bread, live generously, don't wait for the perfect time. And then he says, work. Verse 6, in the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Do you ever get tired? Do you ever get tired of living by faith? Don't you wish sometimes that, you know, we have the Bible, the Word of God, and I won't throw it today, I promise you, all right? But we have God's Word, but don't you wish sometimes He would just sit up on that throne take a selfie recording of himself and say, Steve, this is exactly what I want you to do. Walk, take six steps out of your house. Take three steps to your motorbike. Drive the 1.2 miles to church. Don't you wish it was like that sometimes? But it's not, is it? You know what the Lord says? When you cast your bread and you don't get sidetracked by the waiting for the perfect time. He says, put yourself to work with what you know. Get up in the morning and do what you know to do in the morning. And at the end of the day, do what you know at the end of the day. Why? Because you don't know what God's doing and you don't know the outcome of it. So be busy at work. Amen? Work hard. Christian, work hard at this thing called life. You work hard at your job. Why don't we put even better effort into this life called the Christian experience? Because that's what he says to do. You know, get up in the morning. He says, plant your seed. Do what's necessary. Stay busy in your purpose of what you are doing. You don't know what will come of it. Trust the Lord. Uh, a, a, a theologian said this. The world is full of things over which one, which one has no control, including the purposes of God. Guys, you, you don't control God. Amen? We submit to God. We surrender to God. We give ourselves to God, but we do not control Him. And to be honest with you, my mind and my heart, my vision, my purpose of life and all of that, is so teeny tiny compared to the all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful living creator of this universe who knows everything. I want to be, I want to be led by that one. Amen? There is no virtue in wishful wondering. But there is hope for those who get busy and do their work. Do you know, you might have come to the church this morning, maybe you read uh, chapter 11 and you thought, man, I, I never thought that the points would be don't waste your life, don't be stopped, don't be lazy. And you think, what is that about? It's about this next reason. You see, I think we can easily think of life as being hard, right? And in our text, it gives us another way to think about life. Do you know what life is? Life is verse 7. Life is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Do, do you know what that means? Listen, do you know what you have? Shola and Erskine, do you know what you have? Do you know what you have, Gary? I mean, I could call everybody's name here. Roy, do you know what you have in life? And I know a little bit about your life. Man, the last couple of years have been hard. They've been heartbreaking, haven't they? But here's what 
you have, you have a gift. And that gift is life. Do you understand? If you're breathing this morning, even in, though it's under the sun and even though it's difficult, light is sweet. See, light is a metaphor for life. That's what Solomon is explaining here. And that life, it's pleasant for the eyes to see the dawn of a new day. Doesn't often the morning bring so much hope? And we get into that day and it's just, it's just blooming with hope and expectation. And yes, sometimes it's difficult, but sometimes it's beautiful too. Amen? I remember the day when we, we held Emily Jane for the first time. I remember when Stephen came home and we had two now and then three and then four and then five and then Micah, six. I remember every single one of them. I remember the day Lisa said yes to marry me. I, I remember the day when God spoke to both of our hearts and convicted and convinced and sealed our heart to come to England 21 odd years ago to serve Christ. Those are beautiful days, amen. Yeah, there's some hardships in there. There's some difficulties in there. But what Solomon wants you to do, and the reason he says, the reason he says all these things about, you know, don't waste your life and don't be stopped and don't be lazy because life is a gift. And you've got to live that gift out. I love how the message, and I know some people won't like me quoting the message. It's kind of weird sometimes. But I love how it puts this verse. Oh, how sweet the light of day and how wonderful to live in the sunshine. Life is good, folks. That's how we need to look at it. It's sweet. It's good to be alive. It's pleasant. It's beautiful to see the days of life. I cannot believe that Lisa and I are grandparents. And when we first held Juniper in our hands, there was a weird thing that happened. I loved that little baby like I've loved no other little baby. Not more than my kids, but because of my kids, because of Emily, because of Jerry. There was a love there. How sweet that day is, amen? And I am so excited for the years to come for more grandbabies, more weddings in my family, more grandbabies. But this is the idea. Solomon wants us to turn from a cynical view of life to a beautiful view of life. And I know and I imagine, because I know some of you, I know your lives, they're hard. They are hard. But that doesn't mean they're not beautiful at the same time. Because the Lord is with you. He's your guide and he's your rock. He has the Holy Spirit that indwells you. If you're a believer, you have the word of God. You have everything to live this life purposely for Christ. Amen? So you know what he says? Because life is a gift. Because we are to live it out. Because we are to live by faith. Because we are to live generously. Because we're not to be stopped. We're not to just wait for the perfect timing because we're not to be lazy because life is a gift. You know what he says? Go enjoy it, but do it responsibly. Live life not in the freedom of just let me get all that I can get, but live life knowing that you answer for how you live. Verse 9 through 10, it says this. If a person lives many years, or rejo hold on. Yes. Verse 7, let me back up a little bit. Life is a gift. I'm getting ahead of myself. But here's what verse 8 tells us. Do you know what verse 8 says? If you've had the blessing to live life. It says if you've gotten to the place where you've lived many years. Doesn't say what many years is. Roy, it could be like you. It could be 25. You know? 
25 could be many years. It could be like Lance, 60. I mean, you know, you know, all those 60 years, Lance, that you live. Well, what's many? But here's what he says. Rejoice in your days. That's what you do. Remind yourself of the good. Rejoice in your days. If life is long and the days are hard, rejoice in them all. And this is a new way for some of us to look at life. We look at life as a gift. We look at life as something that he's blessed us with. We say it is good to be alive. And so we live that life. But the Lord says, then go live it. Enjoy it. Eat and drink. And he tells us earlier in Ecclesiastes, eat and drink and, and all of this stuff. But what does that mean? Here's what I think Solomon is trying to tell us. Because youth and age is a number. It's not, net, I'm sorry, it's not a number. It's a mindset. I'm 58 years old and I think I'm still 18 sometimes. And I try to do stupid things like the picnic last week and play that game. And, and I got bowled over. And then I don't play, didn't play anymore. I think I'm young. Here's what Solomon is saying. Don't get to the place where you say, I'm done living. Live your life and enjoy it now, but do it under the guise that you will answer for how you do it. Verses 9 and 10. Rejoice in your youth. Let your heart cheer you. Do what your heart desires, he says, in the days of, of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart, in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. It means live responsibly. We're trying to live under the sun in this broken world. You know what the world does? They live haphazardly. They let their heart and their lusts and their desires, as we used to do, and just to live and direct us, and, and we just go berserk kind of thing. But Solomon says, I've done that. Don't do that. No, you answer to God. Manage your living by the reality of standing before God and Him bringing everything we do into account. But this verse also gives us the idea of not just eternal answering for how we've lived, we have to live in a way that we know we will answer to here on this earth. Get in your car or whatever. Lance, get on your bicycle. Fly down Chiswick High Road at 60 mile an hour. You probably won't get a ticket because there's very few police officers around. But if you did, you'd be held in judgment for what you did. And so that's what Solomon is saying. Live this life knowing that you have a responsibility to live it with this idea of judgment. Don't go crazy. I say this to a lot of the young people. You know, I was talking to someone recently, and they said they went to the pub, and, and I know at times they've had a difficulty with, with drinking and stuff. I said, so how many did you have, and what did you do? And, and, and I'm helping him be accountable. And he said, I kept it right. I, I, I did it knowing them that I am accountable to God for how I do. That's how we are to live our life. Look at verse 10. This is what balances it out. Verse 10 says, Remove vexation from your heart. Put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Since your heart is to guide you, Watch. Put out the things that would cause your heart to live irresponsibly. What are you feeding with? What are you putting into your heart and into our minds and in, into our life that you, we think we got it under control, but if we feed ourselves too much with it, maybe it'll get us under control. And we have to guard ourselves against that. This is living life under the sun. Solomon is telling us we have to live with guideposts. 
We have to live with direction in our life. We just don't go live haphazardly. But what's the key? What is the key to all this? It really lies in verse 1. We will see the key to the book of Ecclesiastes next week. But I believe this will start bringing us into that direction. And here's what it's all about. In verse 1, the very beginning of it, it says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth. Again, I think it's Solomon saying, I wish I hadn't forgotten. I wish I had stayed in that place. But that word remember in the original, it's more than just bringing to mind. It's more than just keeping it to the forefront. You know what? I've got, I've got God over here. I've got his principles. I've got his way of life. Yeah, yeah, I see it. I see it. I, it's there. I'll, I'll remember it every now and again. It's more than that. It's actually what, what, what Solomon is saying here. It is, it is the word to remember it means to bring into reverence. Reverence God. You know what that word reverence, it's more than just, wow, he's awesome. It's more than just thinking God is this amazing Savior and Lord and Creator. To have reverence or to reverence him is to, is to do this. And I think as I studied this out and I, and I saw it, it really blew my mind a little bit because I don't think of it this way. But reverencing God means this. To understand that we belong to him. Can I say it a different way? It is to understand, and I quote a very old time preacher. I can't remember his name. He says this. To reverence God is to remember that you are his property. And that you are to serve him from the start of your life to the end of your life. And you do that because at the end of your life, the way you serve is possibly limited to what you could do when you were younger. You know what he's saying? He's saying to reverence God is to cast your bread on the water. Live by faith. Live the adventure. Give your life generously to the Lord and to other people. Don't be stopped by the circumstances of life and don't be lazy about it. Work at this thing called your Christian life. Trust him. Look to him. Remember him. Reverence him. Solomon is an old man now. He's in his youth. And in his youth, he reverenced God, but he allowed the under the sun to pull him away. And he says, remember the creator. Be in all of him. Give him your life. Serve him with all your days. The one who has given you life. You ever think about this? He knows your name. He knows who you are. He made you. You being you. He didn't make you with, with doing the sins you want to do. He made you his, his creation. To live for him and to give him glory. And that's what Solomon says we are to do. And here's what he means through, by verses 2 through 7. He will talk about li strange things. He'll talk about animals losing their, their fur. And he'll talk about the grinders not grinding. And he'll talk about the keepers of the house trembling. And he'll talk about how the strong men are bent. And he'll talk about how the, how, how the light and the moon and the stars are darkened. And the clouds return for rain. And he does all these picture things. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about do that before you can't do that. Do that. Live for God. Live abundantly for Christ before you get to the place in your life where you can no longer go on the street and serve Christ. Before you can no longer give your life on a, on a more uh, energetic basis. You know what he's saying? Young people, don't do my mistake. Live for him now. And live for him tomorrow. And live for him the next day. 
And as you get older, you will have this life that you live for him. But don't wait till you're older because you won't have the life to live for him that you would have had if you did it when you were young. That's what he's saying, amen? And all those pictures, it's talking about losing sight. It's talking about when your legs begin to weaken and your body begins to become frail and your body is ravaged by pain. He's talking about when your hearing fades and your sleep becomes difficult and you lose physical dexterity and you become fearful, specifically, of falling. When you don't want to go out of the house anymore. When you don't want to be able to do those things, the loss of your youthful desires, and then he says, and then death comes. He's saying, beloved, don't waste your life. Live it for Christ. How do you do that? By keeping your eyes on God. By reverencing Him. By remembering Him. Life is fading Every single person in this room, your life is fading. Vitality is going. Even if, like Joe, he runs 62 miles a week or something like that. His vitality is still fading. I bet you feel more tired now than you did even five years ago after a run. Yeah, a little bit, Joe says. <laughs> that might be an understatement, but I know that when I come out of the gym, Six years ago when I started lifting, I was like, yeah, I can do this. Now I come out of the gym, I'm not sure if I should have done that. Vitality is fading. And beloved, that's what he's saying in this text. Ecclesiastes really is about don't let the world destroy you and don't waste your life. It's too fleeting and you'll get to the place one day where you can't. Now, I want to say this. It doesn't mean that you can't serve God when you're old. Look at Joe. All right? You can't, that's not what it means. It doesn't also mean that if you're an older person, that you have no purpose and meaning in the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that at all. It simply means wake up, don't waste it, live for Him. And I'll close with this and we'll go right into the Lord's Supper. In a few minutes, we're going to take the juice and we're going to take the bread, which are both in that one same thing there. But we're going to take those things, those elements, and we're going to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Can I tell you something? Do you know what I think really the application here is this? I don't know about you, but I forget sometimes the great sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And, and I know what our minds go to. It goes to the nailing of his body on that tree. It goes to the, 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 the pressing down of those thorns upon his head and then all the blood dripping on his face. It goes to when the, in, in the palace or whatever, when the, the praetorian guards or the guards were, were punching Jesus. I, I think sometimes of, of an SAS soldier, a SEAL Team 6 soldier. That would be the equivalent of those guards. Those big, strong, muscular men. Those violent men. Beating Christ. We think of that. We think of all that suffering and all that that he went through, we think of the, the crucify him, crucify him. We think of the rejection, the, the leaving of the disciples. We think of all that earthly stuff. But do you know what the greatest, the greatest sacrifice, the greatest yielding up that he gave is that when he was in eternity, as God, with God, he didn't think to hold on to it, but he let it go for you and I. That's what he did for us. And I'm sure you get tired of hearing it, but Philippians 2 is beautiful. Though he was God, he didn't think of holding on to his 
deity. He didn't think of equality with God as something to keep. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and he died a criminal's death on a cross. That's what he did for us. So when we are under the sun, can I tell you something? Remember what he did for you. Remember that he, and I'm just playing this game, that he thought of your name because he could. Did he? I don't know. But he certainly could. He knew you before the foundation of the world. Think about what he's done. Think about his sacrifice. And as we now think about that, and we'll think about his broken body, and we'll think about the death that he, he gave, that the blood that he shed, meaning the death, the, his death and dying. I'd like to ask Ed and Bang if they would come. And I'd like them to pass out the elements for the Lord's Supper this morning. <clears throat> 